like to welcome everybody who's joining us for Tree Talk with the Metro Tree Advisory Committee. We're going to be starting in about five minutes or so. If you've just joined us, thank you. We are going to be starting shortly in just a few minutes. I want to welcome you to the Tree Talk with the Metro Tree Advisory Committee. But we'll be starting here in just a few minutes. If you've just joined us, we'll be starting shortly. Thank you for joining the Tree Talk with the Metro Tree Advisory Committee. Starting shortly, just waiting a little bit longer. Appreciate you giving us just a few more minutes and then we will start. While we're waiting to start, I did want to let everyone know as um, you are listening to today's presentation with the um, uh, conversation between uh, Dan and Jennifer Smith, you can enter questions that you might have at the bottom of the screen. You're going to see a little bubble box with a Q&A below it, and you can enter questions there. Um, most of those questions will probably be answered at the end of the webinar by Jennifer. So as you're listening to the conversation, you think about any questions you might have, feel free to just pop them in right down there. We hope to start here shortly. We're actually waiting for Dan. He's having a little bit of technical difficulty. Sharon? Yes. Hi. Um, I just want to go ahead and make a few announcements that the uh, tree talk coming up uh, next week, um, next Tuesday, is on the Emerald Ash Borer. And for those who don't know, that is um, we're having an epidemic and we're gonna lose, unless our native ash trees are treated, we're gonna lose 100% of our ash trees. We've already seen a lot of loss this growing season and a lot of dieback, but we estimate that there's about 1.6 million ash trees just, just in Davidson County. So you think wow. of that widespread devastation and we're trying to get the word out to all the citizens so they can make their management plan and prepare for what they're gonna, um, they're going to do. So I encourage everyone to come next week um, to the webinar. And uh, they, again, that's uh, next Tuesday at noon. And you registered the same place where you registered for this webinar. That's really good information. I think a lot of times people don't realize, uh, first of all, that there is um, a ash tree epidemic and um, maybe even what an ash tree looks like. I know when I first heard about this several years ago, uh, Jennifer, I have to ask you, what, what does an ash tree look like? And uh, a lot of folks in Nashville um, have trees in their yard. And if you're like me, you may recognize the tulip poplar. 
and the, um, um, you know, the red bud or dogwood, but then some of those other trees you might not be sure about. So the um, emerald ash borer um, webinar is very useful, not just for you, but your neighbors, just to become aware of what's going on and what you need to do if you have, or what you can do, I should say, if you have ash trees. In exactly. Your yard. I see Dan Vaughn. Right. Dan, are you there? He's muted. Yeah, sorry about that, Jennifer. Sorry I'm late. You're good. Oh, no problem. Well, everybody, we are ready to get started. Thank you once again for uh, joining the Tree Talk with the Metro Tree Advisory Committee. My name is Sharon Smith. I'm Assistant Director of Public Works, and I really appreciate everyone taking time out of their very busy Tuesday uh, to maybe have lunch and uh, learn a little bit more about trees. Uh, Jennifer Smith, a Public Works Horticulturalist and the coordinator of the Metro Tree Advisory Committee, among many other things, is going to be leading the discussion today and will introduce our guest. Jennifer, you're on. Great. Thank you. So our guest today is Dan Albright, and he is an ISA certified arborist, and that's with the International Society of Arboriculture, and she's, he's also certified as a utility specialist, so we're very grateful for him to spend this time. And I will say that um, I have been giving presentations throughout the community for many years, and I always get the uh, NES tree pruning question, so I thought, well, great. Um, I'm always able to explain utility pruning is different than um, what you might do in your own yard. And so this is a great opportunity to, to uh, understand why trees uh, that have conflict or issues with utility lines are pruned a certain way. But one of the first things I like to do um, when I do tree talk is find out um, the guest what their favorite tree is. And he certainly picked a, a wonderful one. Um, one of my favorites, it's a uh, it's, it's kind of a mystery tree because it was thought to be extinct for so long. Dan, why is uh, the Don Redwood your favorite tree? Well, you actually you hit it on the head, Jennifer. That was uh, part of my fascination with it. Um, for some time, it was thought to be extinct. Um, they found a lost grove in China in the 40s, I believe. Uh, at that point, seed collection started and they started a propagation effort where they sent uh, seeds to um, arboretums all over the world. Um, and that was kind of the whole recovery of, uh, of that tree and uh, did a little bit of research on it when I was in school. I went to uh, Western Kentucky University and was in the horticulture club there, did some propagation off some seed collections we did at Bernheim Arboretum um, just south of Louisville, Kentucky. And um, yeah, I thought it was quite fascinating. Very old, uh, has been found in the fossil records from eons ago and uh, always thought that it was just kind of a really cool story and a uh, beautiful tree, uh, really nice form. Obviously not the most ideal for um, being a power line friendly tree just due to the fact to how large it gets. But um, well, yeah, it does. so. Uh, over time, it can get, what, 70 to 100 feet tall, but look how spectacular the fall color is. I mean, that's a showstopper. Yeah, and they've uh, developed some cultivars that have, you know, some brilliant fall color and a, a golden uh, yellow. Um, the, uh, the varieties, the names are escaping me, but there are several in production that uh, have, a, have a great fall color. And I think it's unique because it's a deciduous conifer, and that's kind of fun, too. Another yeah, that was something I always, always thought, you know, much like the, uh, much like the bald cypress. I uh, thought it was pretty neat that it is a... Uh, it is a um, deciduous conifer and uh, kind of kind of makes it unique besides just all the history behind it as well. So we're going to move on, talk about utility um, issues and tree conflicts. NES, I think, does a really good job of, um, well, let's see, there we go, educating the community about tree, tree issues. And one of the things that I appreciate when I get my NES bill is this NES Connect and it has some factoids about trees and other things in it. So I hope everyone um, pays attention to, to that. But I know, um, gosh, it's been probably 20 years ago or, or so, NES did a survey and asked the community, well, how often is it okay to have your utility off? And of course, 
people said no. And of course, uh, manufacturers who, you know, time lost without electricity is, is, is um, they can't produce. So um, they went back and reviewed their tree line clearance program. And um, I think they've done a good job to to have sustainable trees, you know, where, where the trees and the, the utility lines connect and have really focused on that. And um, that's kind of some of the things we're gonna talk about today. So um, again, these, these are all slides from the, their publication that, that you get in the, um, in the mail. But let's talk about um, the pruning techniques that are, in, that are endorsed by the International Society of Arboriculture and then the ANSI standards, um, the National Institute of Standards um, and Pruning. And I have some more slides that um, we'll look at that. But, you know, I think some of the, the questions I get is, oh, they look, they look so odd or unsightly or you're killing the tree. But frankly, you're keeping um, the structure of the, of the tree intact in doing these types of, of prunings. Um, so um, what might a homeowner, um, before you all go out and prune, what might a homeowner receive um, from NES or one of their contractors about work that's gonna be done maybe in their yard or their neighborhood? That's a good question, Jennifer. So um, usually uh, well before we start our work planning stage, we will send out a postcard um, to everyone that is on a circuit that we're getting ready to uh, trim. Um, the postcard um, has our hotline number on it, gives some information that we have, um, you know, folks coming out to uh, survey the area. Um, there's also an automated call, whoever's, um, depending on the household, whoever's phone number is tied to the NES account, they will receive an automated message from NES that basically states uh, we will have work planners, um, arborists coming out to basically walk all those power lines and, and check for uh, clearance issues, for trees that may be in bad shape. And then um, when they do come out, they will leave a, a door hanger or a sticky note on the residence where work needs to be performed, whether it be um, a tree that just needs to be pruned or brush maybe growing around a pole or vines growing up guy wires or something like that or a tree that maybe is in bad shape that is in decline that may need to be removed um, there'll be check boxes on that that sticky note that'll uh, inform the customer if they're not at home at that time when they come by of what work needs to be done as well as the hotline number um, if we're unable to contact them when we're out in the field so the the arborists who get who work around a live wire, um, they have to have special training to work Correct. in that zone. So um, the folks that are trimming trees for us, they are line clearance certified tree trimmers. Uh, they are required to go through um, extensive training um, in order to work near um, and you know within 10 foot of a high voltage power line. Um, so it, it's a bit different than maybe um, someone that you would hire to come out and do work um, on your property. Um, if, if those folks come out, uh, very rarely do they have that line clearance certification, which not only requires training for those individuals, but also has a lot to do with uh, safety and the equipment that they are operating uh, near those power lines. Safety, very important there. Absolutely. Yes. So this is another um, part of uh, insert that's um, educating the community about tree line clearance. And um, I'm, I'm always able to um, use my finger basically and do the, the V cut or the L cut um, when I'm giving talks. But here it, it really shows us what the different pruning, you see this V cut or I call it the L cut or linear cut here. But um, talk a little bit about um, about that and why it's structurally keeping the tree sound. Yes, yeah, so on both of those um, types of trims, uh, one of the hardest points that uh, I have to try to explain with customers is that, um, you know, a lot of times folks think that if it doesn't look symmetrical, that it's not healthy. 
Um, as, as you and I know, Jennifer, um, topping and rounding over trees and making them perfectly symmetrical is not an accepted practice and actually leads to more problems. So when we do the directional pruning, which is, is what you're pointing out there, uh, whether it be a, a V trim or a side trim that, that looks more like an, an L, uh, that is where we are pruning and we're going back, to, uh, the directional pruning where we're going back to a healthy lateral limb. Uh, that should be a limb that is at least uh, one third the size of the limb that we are cutting back. And uh, that is um, what both um, International Society of Arboriculture and ANSI has, has looked at as far as uh, finding those good pruning points where the uh, tree can actually um, seal over those wounds as compared to a, a stub cut or an improper lateral cut that leaves um, a wound that is very hard to seal and close over. So. A lot of what you're seeing with those uh, pruning types are in fact going and doing the directional pruning going back to those healthy lateral branches that is, is more uh, better for the overall structure of the tree. So the um, pruning that you uh, do, however, um, you have like the type of tree it is, the voltage that surrounds it and the proximity of the branches to the power line. So that helps dictate if you do a V cut or a lateral cut each one's different. Yeah, and, and you know, as in most cases, uh, every situation we come to is, is usually different. Very rarely are they all the same. So um, the actual pruning uh, type kind of depends on, you know, where that tree is in, in proximity to uh, where the power lines are. Uh, if the trees are a little bit more offset, that's where you're seeing that side trimming that looks more like an L. If the trees are close or directly underneath the lines, that's where you're seeing, um, you know, the V prune and, and, and that, kind of, uh, that kind of trim. One question that I get quite often, um, there's the power lines at the top that are the, the ones you have to go 10 feet away from. They're the electric lines. Uh, high voltage, and then there's the lower lines that are communication lines, cable and stuff. So how do you approach each one of those, the high lines, the electric lines, and the, and the lower lines that are the cable lines? How do you all approach those? So, so we do um, practice species-specific pruning to where, first off, we're looking at um, the growth rate of the tree. If you have, uh, you know, like a silver maple or a hackberry or something that as a faster growing tree, we do require um, more, more clearance for something that grows faster. Um, you know, something that's slower growing, uh, eastern red cedar or southern magnolia, they require uh, less clearance since they don't grow quite as fast. Uh, when we're looking at the um, different lines on each pole, um, the top line, you are correct, is, is normally the primary. Uh, that is the hot line. Uh, we do require, you know, say for example, a hackberry, 12 feet of clearance. Um, for the primary. The next line underneath the primary is normally the neutral, which is um, for all species is six feet of clearance. And then the communication line, which is usually the dark uh, black thicker line that runs lowest on the poles. Um, we generally uh, look to be about a foot of clearance on those. If uh, there's a large limb that is pressing and putting a lot of weight um, on the communication line and stressing the power poles, we would look at removing something like that, but but generally, um, you know, the main focus is for the primary and, and up around the neutral as well. And then also you, um, when you have your transformers, you make sure that you have the clearance around those as well. Um, those are things I can hear big, you know, blows and, and my light, when my lights go out, the transformers are blowing. So that's important to have that clearance. Correct. Generally around around a pole um, for tree species, we're looking at uh, 10 feet of clearance. Um, shrubs and, and lower growing uh, species, you know, uh, usually around three foot of clearance. And that's not only just for uh, contact issues, but also for, for access when we do have our line crews out and uh, they're, they're trying to get access to a pole or they need to replace a pole, having that, that pole zone clear. Uh, does aid in, in, you know, making sure our linemen are able to safely uh, work uh, around the equipment and, and not be obstructed when, when they're dealing with uh, restoring electricity or doing basic, basic maintenance. So you talked earlier about tree topping. 
um, the Metro Tree Advisory Committee has a series of educational panels that we take to the like the lawn and garden show or the uh, Earth Day events to educate uh, people on, about trees. And when they see pictures like this, <laughs> it, it there's a reaction, and it's uh, it's never a, a nice reaction. And, and I've heard so many times, well, that should be illegal. Um, how ugly? Why do people do that? And I think um, the as you were mentioning earlier, this you know, the L cut or the V cut keeps the structure of the tree. And the tree needs branches so they can produce leaves because it is on the leaves that they take the nutrients and water up to the roots, to the leaves. And with sunlight, they photosynthesize and produce the food. Now, when you top a tree, it's starting the death because one, there's too many cuts, too, too big of cuts too. The, the tree, as you mentioned, can seal itself off, callous over, but it's just too many to do, too much energy. And the tree's also thinking, oh my goodness, I don't have a way to produce my food anymore. So they send out these little weak branches that this break and they blow in the wind. It's not sustainable. So um, I can see why people don't like this. And frankly, it's just ugly. Um, so this is why you all do the, the cuts that you do is it, it keeps the structural, important structural integrity of the tree. Um, interesting, however, is that we also get questions, well, but I wanted, my tree was too big. Um, and there's ways it's called crown reduction. It works to reduce your crown and you can go back to the lateral branches throughout the tree. You're not, you're not just doing, oops, um, you're not just doing this topping here. You're actually keeping the structural and the character of the tree. You're not removing the character by just giving it a bowl cut. So there's options if you just simply want a, a established tree that's going to be shorter. So that's something, something to consider. Now back to NES. Um, I've had to divide this this flyer into two two places, but um, we, the Metro Tree Advisory Committee, worked with NES on on these tree selections here. So you all, when people are plant considering planting trees in in their yard, you want them to look up and say, oh, I you know I need to be aware of my overhead utilities, and so we came up with a, a list of large, medium, um, and small trees. That's that's on the next page and even shrubs and how far like the large trees need to be about 45 feet away um, from the power lines the medium trees about 35 feet and so this um, document if you will um, is on our website at trees.nashville.gov so if you're planning on planting some trees you can go in and we list um, you all have listed here different some examples of different types of trees, like obviously the large tree would be an oak. Um, and you have, you know, different types of ornamental pears um, and um, different trees there and then for the smaller trees. But this is a good guide. Again, you all reaching out to the community and trying to um, educate the citizens about how to have sustainable urban forests, which is what our trees are in our community. And what we all also want is um, power that never goes out. So I commend you all on what you're doing on your outreach efforts. The right tree, right place is a, is a, uh, a great thing too, Jennifer. Just, you know, we, we, the last thing we wanna do is have to come in and, and take a large portion of a, of a tree out and, and prune it. Um, you know, when, when folks are, uh, I look at a lot of the developments that are, that are going up in Nashville uh, currently, and, and I still see it quite commonly where, um, and it's usually not necessarily a, a homeowner, but maybe somebody developing a property where uh, the large trees are being planted right back under the lines where maybe they remove some in order to construct a property. So, uh, you know, having that little bit of insight and, and thinking about, um, you know, even though the tree might only be five or eight feet tall at the time of planting when it's <laughs> wanting to be 50 to 80 feet tall, 
and it's directly underneath the lines, um, we'd much rather take the approach that's uh, presented here with right tree, right place, and you know, look for maybe some ornamentals or something smaller to plant out in the front, and then maybe having a, a larger tree offset from those lines just to prevent those conflicts. And, and it also does come into uh, you know, a, a safety issue as well, as we've seen in a lot of these storms lately. We've had a lot of um, tree and power line conflict, and these are trees that are even well outside of our easement that have fallen over in, in the straight line winds and obviously tornadoes. But um, those do create a quite a, um, a safety issue, especially when we have folks trying to restore power, or trying to uh, get poles put back up, get the electricity back on. Uh, so it's, it's not only, uh, helpful to prevent that basic, uh, you know, cycle maintenance, but al also on the, uh, the side of in a restoration effort when uh, we do have those areas clear and, and don't have uh, large tree species directly under the lines. Another thing that NES has done um, throughout their program of um, line clearance is they do have a tree replacement program. And it's, um, it's not for every case, but there are some cases where it, it, there's just too much, um, too much of the tree in, in the power lines. And so you, can you talk a little bit about your tree replacement program and who is that offered to? Yeah, not a problem at all, uh, Jennifer. When uh, we do a, a tree replanting, um, you know, basically uh, if, if we come out and identify a tree that, that is a problem, or a tree that we're gonna to have to remove a, a large portion of the canopy and an NES uh, employee or representative informs the customer that we need to remove this tree. Uh, that would be the, the scenario where uh, we would offer a replanting. Um, and uh, in other cases, you know, uh, that really don't qualify as much as, as if um, someone requests a tree be removed. Uh, generally, we're, we're looking at the replanting program for um, trees that we're informing customers we need to remove. Um, so that's kind of the, the difference between uh, something that would qualify and something that would not. Um, and then in most scenarios, we, we would offer um, the replanting or we would offer a, a stump grinding, one or the other, uh, not both. Um, so those are kind of uh, the different situations. And then, uh, like it says in your slide here, generally we, we start the planning um, in the fall um, and then we work through, um, you know, the winter and then try to try to get done, get things wrapped up before it starts getting warm and the spring flush starts, so. Right, you wanna get the trees planted before the leaves come out. That makes it right. hard on the tree to replant, transplant. So I know you have this form here. Um, there's different trees that people can um, choose from. And you also are updating. I know the Metro Tree Advisory Committee has worked on this new list with you all and adding um, some native, um, what we call pollinator trees, which we're excited about too. So that's just another tool you all have really to help um, keep the electricity on, but keep our urban forests uh, sustainable. That's great. That's a good tool. Um, we talked about over, overhead utility lines um, earlier when you're choosing your right place um, to plant, but also um, underground utilities and a little bit about the, they call it call before you dig, the 811 free service. A um, little bit about that, or I know that it takes 70, you have to call 72 hours in advance, no weekends or holidays, and you get a ticket. They give you a ticket to say that we've um, surveyed and believe there's no underground utilities and the ticket's good for 15 days. Right, and they, and they will send out um, someone to inspect and mark, uh, whether it be um, water or um, fiber optic or electric, they will come out and, and you know, put down paint to mark uh, where those lines are and uh, you know, aid and, and assist to make sure that uh, someone doesn't unfortunately you know, hit a gas line or a, a water line or even worse, an electric line. So um, that, that is a, a great service and we do encourage um, anyone before they dig, whether it be for a tree or anything else on their property to uh, call 811 um, and they will come out and, uh, and take care of marking those underground utilities to prevent any issues. And that is a free service, but do note you, it's um, 72 hours, don't call today for some, 
for digging tomorrow. Um, now I do know in Middle Tennessee, I can guarantee you, you will hit some limestone somewhere when you're planting a tree. It never seems to fail here. The next um, item, and again, these are all um, articles from the NES Connect that comes out in your um, bill. And we talked a little bit earlier about the ash tree epidemic in Nashville. And um, it mentions here Metro Public Works, and I'm with Metro Public Works, that um, if you have a, a ash tree in your public right of way, now that is the area, generally speaking, a general rule of thumb is from the back of a sidewalk to the street, may include a green strip, or in your yard, there's that rectangle water main box at so the back of that to the street. So if you have a ash tree in that area, and you can go to our trees.nashville.gov and download our brochure, you can, um, and there's a lot of information about it there, but then you can um, call our hub, Nashville 311, and report that you have an ash tree, because we will be taking those down. However, if you choose yourself, we will not be treating them. But if you choose yourself to treat them, you also need to let us know so that we will not be cutting them down. But um, I see um, that NES has their own policy here. Here, um, Dan. Yes. Yeah, so, um, in most in most situations, we will have to have um, either one of the senior utility arborists or one of our uh, representatives uh, come out and take a look at what we're actually dealing with. Um, if you know the tree is within uh, 10 foot of an energized conductor, there would be a part of that process that NES uh, would have to be involved, whether it just be uh, trimming back a few limbs um, to make it safe enough for someone to privately remove it or for Metro to remove it, um, or an entire tree removal. It would kind of be, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a case by case uh, situation where we would have to um, review because uh, like most things dealing with trees and trees and power lines especially seldom is there uh, the exact same case going on every time it's usually uh, different terrain um, you know a lot of different variables that we would have to take into consideration uh, before we'd be able to uh, determine exactly what work uh, NES would need to perform on the tree. So you're looking at the ash trees and we talked earlier a little before you got on that you know, we have 1.6 million, we believe, ash trees in Davidson County. So these are the ones that will have some com potential conflict with the wires. So an ash tree that's next to it, like you mentioned, you might just have to cut out a few of, of the branches, perhaps. But if there's an ash tree that has the potential to fall, it's in the fall zone is how we call it, of a electric um, high wire, then you all would take that in consideration as well. Yeah, and we and we would have to, you know, come out and and take a look at it and see exactly uh, how close it is, you know, uh, what kind of feed we're talking about, uh, the voltage of the line, um, you know, there'd be a lot of different variables. Uh, terrain, especially, is is one that's uh, important as well. But we would uh, send somebody out and and review each of those case by case, and then determine what what kind of work we would need to perform. I mentioned earlier the trees.nashville.gov website and that you can download this very popular uh, brochure that the Tree Advisory Committee put together about the tree epidemic, the ash tree epidemic in Nashville. And no, this isn't the size of, of the ash borer. The ash um, borer is about the size of a cooked grain piece of rice. So this is just to get your attention. So um, another um, thing that people almost hate just as much, I shouldn't say that hate, but yeah, um, as the um, topping of the trees are um, invasive plants like the, like the Bradford pear. And I think this is great advice you've had in your um, connect notes about how this is just not a good good selection. One of the things that that gets me about this tree is that we want our trees to grow and be sustainable because when they're about five years old, they really are big enough to do the air quality um, needs that control. 
um, stormwater mitigation. They're home to our birds and other wildlife. And um, that's about the time that the Bradford pear, who has all those branches that are so close together, you know, they, they move like this um, in the wind and it's just too many branches coming together in one place and there's too much pressure there. And as it gets bigger, it, it, it just weakens that spot and that's when they start um, falling apart. And we've lost five years that we could have grown a tree that would have been sustainable for 70 years, 100 years, 150 years. But these, you know, these are very aggressive when, you know, when they revert back to their, their native um, trees um, and they have the cultivars have the, the thorns that can like pop a tire. But yeah, and they, I can't I can't agree with you more, Jennifer. Those uh, at one time I know they were extremely uh, extremely popular, and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about before with uh, the the perfectly symmetrical. My wife calls them Lego trees because they kind of look like you know the little Lego trees you'd find in a set where it's this like oh, almost why? like a lollipop. And uh, <laughs> you're you're exactly right. They're extremely weak. They're very prone to failure, and they are one of those that. Uh, you see folks topping all the time just due to the fact that they get so tall that they just split apart because they're just, uh, they have, uh, they're flawed as far as uh, the, the design. So, um, and, and of course, like you've mentioned, I've run across the, uh, the wild ones that come off of the planted ones and they do have a pretty nasty thorn on them. Uh, I've seen a couple spots where they really just start to take over and uh, choke out the more native species. And part of what we're looking at, like you had mentioned before as well, with uh, trying to incorporate some, some more native species and with the replantings as well to try to prevent um, a lot of what we've seen from, from the pears and some of the other uh, introduced species that are causing a lot of problems. Well, one of the concerns I've had all along with the ash tree when they, when they die and they can, they, they're very brittle and they can snap over. It's called the ash snap. And they're in our forested areas and um, they're gonna create some pockets of light throughout our forest. And, and a pocket of light is, is an opportunity for any type of plant. But these, these aggressive pear trees are really taking over our, our woods. And so we really, this is a subject for another day, but we really wanna get in there and get some um, of the, pollen, the, the native pollinators trees put in there in those pockets of light so that our forest doesn't, um, you know, just keep getting more invasive um, plants in it. But I, I, I really enjoyed that you've written here in your bulletin here, other beautiful bad ideas. I like that bad ideas include the Japanese honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, and all species of privet in the English ivy. Those are just taking over a lot of the forest floors. And when they come in, they, they just shade out any of our native trees that are trying to get established. So that's why we don't like those as well. And here's another top one that has issues. Um, there it's the bamboo and it's problematic um, near power lines. You all, what do you all just have to go in and cut it? What do you all do? Yeah, the, uh, you know, basically about the only option we have for bamboo is uh, when it's starting to get up into energized conductors, um, we do cut it to the ground. Uh, it grows so quickly that, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, technically being a grass, it's, it's not something that we could really trim. Um, we do have a lot of situations where it is used as a privacy screen between one property and another, usually falling in the uh, utility easement. Uh, so it, it, it makes for a difficult conversation about every three and a half years where we do have to clear uh, bamboo and, and cut it down to the ground. And a lot of times, even if we cut out, um, you know, our easement, there's still a very large mature bamboo that starts to hang over because uh, now that it's, it's open through that area, it's used to kind of having the support of the other bamboo growing around it. And those hang over as well towards the towards our uh, electric lines and it's it's just a kind of an ongoing problem and uh, it is extremely invasive and once it's there uh, it's it's almost impossible to get rid of so uh, it it makes for uh, a lot of problems not only with 
coming into contact with lines, but also with access when we do have a situation where we need to do maintenance or come back in to do storm restoration and we come up to, you know, a couple hundred feet worth of bamboo. It, it takes a lot longer to get up, to get work done and get the lights back on safely when, when there's those kind of obstructions in the easement. So I suggest anybody who, who is into bamboo and wants to see it, the Japanese garden at Cheekwood has a lot of different bamboo. It's a great place to go or perhaps I can put it in a container where it won't get into your lawn. But I've, I've had friends whose neighbors have planted it and it has just invaded their yard and there's nothing. I mean, they've tried, um, you know, digging out a couple of feet of, of topsoil, bringing in new topsoil, putting in a barrier even four feet deep. And it, you know, it's maddening because you're, you think you've got it and about a year or two, maybe two later in the middle of your yard, there'll be a shoot that finds its way through and um, some, something, another thing to avoid. Now the next one that you all talked about um, is vines. This is, I believe, ivy here, but there's all sorts of, of vines that grow up into trees and wreak havoc. And I know I, um, here in Metro, get called out to look at trees and I'll I'll go, I, can't, I can't even see the tree. I don't know if it what it, what's under there. It could be have all sorts of issues, but they're hidden. And so we try to go back and you know cut some of the vines off, but it has to grow you know die slowly. Um, so I'm just encouraging everyone if you've got a little bit of vine on any of your trees, um, go ahead and start cutting them, cutting it down, and even a few feet away from your tree. But you all probably at NES have to deal with this every day. Yeah, and, and the majority of the time, the, the issues we're dealing with, um, not necessarily always coming from vines growing up the trees, but usually vines growing on our on our anchors, on our guy wires, oh. um, up the power poles, around fences at small substations. Um, but it, yeah, it's it's a ongoing struggle, uh, just trying to trying to maintain those and as quickly as they grow, whether it be wild grapevine or like you've mentioned here, uh, English ivy or poison ivy or uh, Virginia creeper. Um, it's, you know, they're extremely fast growing and uh, they, they do present problems. And great point that you mentioned as well is uh, how they kind of mask and hide, um, you know, something uh, that you not, you're not gonna see on a tree, whether it be some decay or, or something else that's taking place, just due to the fact that it completely covers it. So. Um, yeah, we, we do have uh, ongoing ongoing issues with uh, with vines and and are are constantly uh, looking for solutions to those problems. I know that um, trees that are really covered with it, the leaves have to compete with the vine for sunlight. So that's not a good thing because that how again how the tree makes their food as the photosynthesis on the leaves and. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm always excited about is the NES is a, a tree line USA and that is a program by the National Arbor Day Foundation and y'all have been I think it's going on eight or nine years now um, and here are some of the um, core standards and I just want to give a plug that um, the state of Tennessee overall is the top state in the country of having these um, programs in our utilities and I, I think that's great. Um, I don't know if you want to review this but I will say that one of the ones that we work on Metro and NES works on together is we co-present um, the annual Arbor Day celebration that we bring all um, groups together and have a moment to honor our trees that's always with the mayor and it's always very special. But um, it talks about your training you said you all do and uh, your all this public education, your outreach that, that we've just, a lot of it seen today. Anything you wanna add there? Yeah, no, uh, Jennifer, that's, you've, you've hit it right on the head. You know, it's, uh, it's a great organization and you are right. There's a lot of uh, utilities in uh, Tennessee that have adopted, uh, you know those standards and, and are a part of uh, Treeline USA. Uh, we we hold our annual worker training. Um, we also go through and just like we talked about with the tree planting and, and uh, 
relief, uh, as well as um, our tree planting program that we do within within our tree trimming program. But uh, it's a it's a great organization, and uh, you know it just continuing on that education and, and making sure that uh, that um, you know we we work with the public and we're good stewards of, of the areas that we're working in. So uh, it's a it's a great thing to be a part of and. And they're responsible for, you know, kind of getting where utility uh, pruning is today with, um, you know, the directional pruning and avoiding topping and, and all the stuff that we've kind of touched on earlier. So um, one of the things that's nothing mentioned but great here things to say about tree line. is trenching and tunneling. Um, so the trenching is one of the things that, um, you know, it's not, as you all know, not, don't do, the, it's not recommended because that's literally just cutting through the roots of a tree trenching but the tunneling is where you go under maybe about four feet under because the roots really grow about the top 18 to 20 24 inches because um they need oxygen so they're not all that deep as we may think they are so that's where the tunneling practice if you all even do much tunneling but that's why you know this really helps get utilities to tunnel versus trench and another thing that you mentioned um, is relief. And that's a long association that NES has had with the Nashville Tree Foundation. And you all have been doing this for years of, of working together to plant trees um, in our community. And traditionally it's been the uh, Saturday before Thanksgiving where, where hun hundreds of volunteers come out and you all help donate trees to be planted in areas where, um, in yards that have uh, power lines running through them. So a power line friendly tree gets planted and um, that's really grown and the tree foundation's doing so many more additional programs that it would be great for everyone to stop by their website and see what volunteer opportunities they have and um, uh, to have to offer. Now, the some of the things that you've talked about, if people have um, questions with um, with um, issues. You have the vegetation management hotline. And what are some of the things that people might want to call that for? Yeah, so um, generally uh, a lot of the questions we do get um, deal with the service line, uh, the actual line that goes from the transformer to the meter on the house. Um, you know, folks generally are asking us what, what we will do around that service line, which is usually just a, a light prune. Uh, we will not remove a tree over a service. Um, if a tree limb breaks and falls on it, we will remove it. But um, basically that, that hotline goes to anything tree related, whether it be, um, like you mentioned before, with the tunneling or if somebody's looking at burying a line or going over underground, um, we, we can come out and kind of take a look and Often that is an option that people want to explore if they don't want uh, trees trimmed on a line that comes down along the side of the property and just feeds their house. Uh, or just basic questions about um, when we start to trim in an area, um, if customers have concerns about the pruning or if you know they think maybe the tree's in bad shape and it's maybe better to remove. Um, basically all things uh, tree related. Um, that's the, the best number to contact is, is the vegetation management hotline. Right. Well that was a lot of that NES does and I applaud them. Um, we mentioned earlier the Emerald Ash Borer. The um, webinar is next Tuesday, September 22nd at 12 noon. And it's really important that you get your management plan, not just if you have an ash tree in your yard, but what if your neighbor has one that could fall and affect your yard? So your house. Um, so these are things you really need to, to tune in about and just in um, closing, um, you know, we have so many different groups in our community working on like, like NES on our, to sustain our urban forests. And just to mention some, uh, the Metro Tree Advisory Committee who presents Tree Talk. Um, and a lot of, of citizens and professionals are um, involved with that group. They're really committed to our trees in our community. We have the Tree Foundation um, that we mentioned a little while ago that does um, Relief Nashville, but they, they have uh, the big old tree contest, uh, the Fall Tree Fest, 
And they also have a program they started in 2017 called the Green Shirts. And so if you're interested in doing a lot of tree planting through volunteer efforts, um, learn, learn more about the, the being trained as a Green Shirt. And then our citywide Root Nashville tree canopy campaign um, our goal there is to plant a half a million trees between now and 2050. Um, and it's taking everyone of the whole community to get involved. And they have a website. If you plant a tree in your yard, you can go on their website and uh, mark, put a dot where you planted that tree and that tree would be counted. And we need your tree to be counted and we need you to plant a tree. And then we also have the Tree Conservation Corps that works a lot on um, legislative issues, but they're um, hosting their fourth annual tree sale. So that's a great way to get trees planted in your own yard. And you can go on their website now and look at all the great tree species they offer. So we're very blessed. We have got a lot of, of energy and synergy going on in our community. And it's really um, collectively making a difference. You know, we we want to you know plant a half a million trees we'll just think we lost so many also during the, the tornado and all these pop-up storms because all of our trees a lot of them frankly are, are you know they die of old age a lot of our, our trees our neighborhoods are so old now that and the trees that were originally planted are you know 50 7500 years old and that's to be expected so we need our citizens to get out and intentionally plant those replacement trees and of course of course care for them. So that was the tree talk. Sharon, have there been any questions? Yes, there's been some really good questions. All right, first question. I have a large pin oak on my property that appears to have a bacterial leaf scorch. Can treatment help? Also, what can I do to prevent this from spreading to my other pin oak right beside the one that's ill? Diane? throwing that to you. I didn't, I'm sorry, Jennifer, I did not hear the second part of that question. Okay, Sharon. So uh, the second part of the question was, will it spread to an adjacent uh, pin oak tree? And, and what kind of bacteria was it, Sharon? I'm sorry. Bacterial leaf scorch, which just sounds bad. I'm going to have to defer to Jennifer on that one. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure on that. There, there are some, there's treatment um, that you can get an injection that will help the tree, but bacterial leaf scorch um, can spread and um, get a hold of trees. And it also depends on the health of that particular tree. Um, but we've lost rows of, of trees to that in our, our area. And, in downtown Nashville, for instance, we had rows of different trees and just went right through them all. But there are some things um, that can help um, defer that initial, that eventual death there. But it's, um, you you know, work with an uh, arborist to get your trees injected. But unfortunately, it's it's not. in the pin oaks here, I think the, limes, the limestone that affects our pin oaks and weakens them to begin with. So they're more susceptible to other issues like the bacterial leaf scorch. The plain trees, they really get it bad here. All right, that's good. Um, I recently saw a post that said, trees never die of old age. Is that a valid statement? <laughs> that's kind of like a trick question. Um, that they're gonna die of something um, and they could be weakened by so many things, diseases and, and insects, winds. Um, but I think at some point they'd lose their vigor to withstand those infestations. And, um, and then they just, they die. But it may not be from one particular thing. It could be a drought. Um, we saw a lot of drought this year um, response from, we had a, um, well, in, we had last September, October, excuse me, August and September, we had a drought, we had an early um, frost freeze in November, and, and especially on conifers, we saw a lot of problems this year with those because of the things that happened months before. So sometimes when you're asked to look at a tree, you really have to do a lot of digging around and 
trying to figure out what what's the issue. Interesting. Um, here's a good question. Why do you see some trees trimmed where they look terrible? Big areas in the middle hold out, which makes them weak on the side on that side and heavy on the other side. And so on on the directional pruning in most scenarios, what we run into is there's not a proper lateral to trim back to. So for example, um, when we're talking about a side trim where it's not necessarily an L, there wasn't that one third size branch to prune back to. So, you know, if you were to cut it and leave a stub, you're, you're gonna damage the tree more by, by doing a poor cut. So removing that limb back to either the healthiest lateral branch or back to the trunk is the next best, best option when you're coming up, when you're doing the utility clearance or directional pruning. I, think, and I, think, I guess sometimes you just have to make the decision of, you know, what, what is the best thing we can do and best way to cut the, the tree back so it's out of the wires and, and avoiding that hazard and keeping the tree as healthy as possible. It, it is a balancing act, you're right. I mean, there's, there's a lot of situations where uh, in order to get, to get enough clearance to uh, prevent, you know, the tree from growing back into the line before we come back, you know, about every three and a half years, uh, it does require to take back, uh, you know, another limb. And, uh, um, you know, each species of tree having a different structure, a different, um, you know, shape, it, it's kind of not necessarily a, a one size fits all mm. pattern. Yeah. But it does look really dramatic and that's where those types of, of prunings get a lot of attention from the public wondering, hey, what's going on here? When actually it is the proper pruning technique for utility lines. So we've got a question. Whose responsibility is it to trim trees that are growing in power lines? And uh, which I believe the answer is that the, uh, the electric utility is. And what is the number residents could call? if they saw trees growing in power lines. So if, if there's a tree that's um, encroaching on a, uh, on a primary line, that, that would be uh, NESs to trim. And uh, the, the number that uh, Jennifer's put up on the screen is for the vegetation management hotline. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, if it's a, a street light wire or if it's an insulated, um, wire there's not it's at a lower voltage um, we, we wouldn't trim line so that's kind of something else you'll see a difference in or if there's a communication line on the adjacent side of a road a lot of times we do get questions about that where folks will ask why we didn't trim um, one side of the road but the other side we did trim and usually that's where there's a communication line running by itself on the other side so it's kind of some common questions we do we do get about uh, why something gets trimmed and why it doesn't get trimmed. Yeah, and that's a good thing for people to realize just because they see a line up there doesn't necessarily mean it's an electric line. There are a lot of utilities um, that I guess you would say piggyback on uh, NES poles. Right. Um, does a dead or dying emerald ash tree create an environment that harbors other insects which can damage other tree species nearby? I'm not sure I understand that question, but uh, the emerald ash borer is host specific to the native ash trees. And come come to the webinar, um, but it, it, uh, it came over um, we believe on ship shipping crates in crates and ship and ships from Asia to the ground zero in this country was in Michigan and has moved, you know, throughout the many of the states, not all of them yet, but um, So they're specific to the ash. Now the ash uh, host a lot of insects, you know, they're beneficial insects that call ash their home and other, you know, birds and other wildlife um, live in our trees. So it's a, it's definitely an epidemic that's going to have major effects on our ecology, for sure. All right, Jennifer, this is one that you and I have talked about in the past. The trees and shrubs that grow 
in your drainage ditch between um, your property and right next to the road, whose responsibility is it to trim or maintain those trees Good and question. shrubs? So in most of that area, and, and it's not one size fits all, but most of that area is considered the public right of way. And um, if there's a tree issue, uh, let's say you, it's fallen or has some major dieback, then you call, you can call our 311 Hub Nashville and report that. And um, we'll go out and inspect it to see if it, it um, needs to be taken down or just needs some pruning. We do not remove healthy trees from the public right away because that's part of our infrastructure that's you know, those trees are out there working for us and um, absorbing pollutants and helping with our stormwater management. So we do not remove healthy trees. Now, if that tree is um, on the right of way, but partially in the private realm too, we will still address that tree. So call 311 and let us know about it. Okay. Uh, Dan, I've got a couple of good questions for you. What does NES do with branches and bamboo that get trimmed? Is it mulched or do you throw it away? It is mulched and uh, it goes to the uh, alternative um, energy center in downtown right close to Shelby Avenue. So uh, we make sure that um, all the material that's chipped and um, that you see going through the chippers and then the crews are working on, um, it doesn't, it does not end up in the, in the landfill. Okay. and. Dan, what are your thoughts on planting shrubs under power lines? In, in most uh, scenarios, you know, shrubs are more ideal for uh, being underneath power lines. Um, I will say that uh, depending on the, uh, the location of where the lines are uh, is something to take into consideration. Uh, if the lines are running through uh, the backyard or the back of your property or the side of your property where there's not a paved or maintained um, gravel drive alongside them, um, keeping that easement as clear as possible is extremely important. If it's something along a roadway, shrubs are more acceptable. Um, there is always running the risk of um, that being damaged though, whether it be um, if we have a storm or if we're doing a restoration effort, if we have to install a new pole or something like that. Um, I always encourage folks to try to plant um, outside of the easement just to prevent um, damaging something and, uh, you know, running into problems down the road. But, um, you know, lower growing species, especially along the roadside are, are what we encourage, if, especially if you have a limited yard where, where you don't have a lot of space. Yeah, and when you're out buying plants and you're thinking about where to plant them, really pay attention to uh, the information. When you go to Lowe's and Home Depot and Morse Nurseries, there's going to be a little um, uh, tag on it that will tell you how high that plant is going to grow. And it's really important to look at the ground and up at the lines and make sure that you're not planting something that could possibly uh, be in the way um, into the lines or even just prevent workers from safely accessing the lines. Um, we've just got a few more questions. Um, are there, what alternative trees are there, pollinator trees to Bradford pears that you can plant next to the power lines? Nine bark, um, there's, uh, you know, the native dogwoods. There's some, you know, some of the red buds that are native. Um, and that list that we, we went over earlier, I'll try to hit back to that. Um, there, Oh, and I'll also say um, that the on that trees.nashville.gov, the Metro Tree Advisory Committee keeps a list of, of recommended trees um, and some not, not recommended. So, um, but the some of the maples are smaller. Um, you can, it's kind of hard to read there, but the, um, the little smaller magnolias like the sweet bay, the trident maple, which is one of my favorite trees, the button bush, um, which is of course native. Um, so there's a host of different things. Um, the white fringe tree, people have traditionally planted that, but that's actually um, susceptible to the emerald ash borer also. It's a fragness. And so we of course don't, don't recommend that at all. It's a non-recommended. So um, there's just, um, you know, uh, 
different again um, ones, and then some of the ones that are aren't native, like the um, Yoshino cherries, um, are very popular as well. All right, we are kind of running out of time here, so really quickly, um, when a tree is pruned, do you treat the tree or do you let it self heal? It's we let native. it self heal. You let it self heal. The tree is amazing how it can protect itself. Like if it has a wound, um, for whatever reason, um, it splits or insects or it, it, it compartmentalizes that so that the wound can't go in and infect the whole tree. And it also, when you get a, a, a cut, it seals it off and protects it from, you know, insects and water in, infiltrating that as well. All right, and do most trees have taproot? And if so, how deep does it grow? And how far from the spine of the tree should one tunnel to avoid the taproot? So no, not, not all trees have tap roots. And one of the things that you really should do is offset your tunneling. And um, we're working on some of those issues right now in the public right away where they're boring to put in um, fiber optics and stuff. So it's just a good rule of thumb is not to tunnel under the center of, of the tree. Always a good thing. Okay, and this is the last one. Does it harm a tree to cut one side from top to bottom all the way back to the trunk? I, ideally, um, you know, we, we would try to not remove more than 30% of the canopy. Um, you know, in some scenarios, we would have to, uh, but we do offer to remove a tree in a, in a lot of those. Um, trees are pretty resilient. Um, really, you'd have to look at the entire canopy as a whole um, because the, once again, uh, just like uh, Jennifer was speaking of, when you properly prune a tree back to that healthy lateral branch, the tree will naturally seal over that wound. And that's part of the reason that we, we make those cuts back to those points instead of doing stub cuts and, and improper lateral pruning. So uh, once again, even though it, it may not be uh, symmetrical, um, overall, it's, it's better, off, better off for the health of the tree. And, and you know, I mentioned, or Dan just mentioned the NES policy that if they have to remove it, there's a potential that they will plant something back, not right there, but somewhere near. And you can also kind of counterbalance that with removing some of the branches on the other side so your weight's not just all, all on one side. And you want to look at the, your roots, if they buttress out, kind of they flare out all sides, then it's got um, some good roots to help it also, you know, stand up, be, be tall. So these are good questions. All right, and that was the last question. Jennifer and Dan, thank you so much for uh, lending your expert to a lot of folks in Nashville that, um, that had uh, questions. This is a great opportunity for people to uh, hear experts speak and uh, I really appreciate your time and everybody out there listening. I really appreciate you joining us and please keep an eye open for upcoming next week. Jennifer, when is the uh, Emerald Ash Board training again? Tuesday, September 22nd at 12 o'clock and please register at trees.nashville.gov. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Jennifer. Really appreciate it. Everybody have a great rest of the day. Thank, Thank you for having me.